Okay, so let's start off with the next set of 10 questions in the 2020 paper, the new paper. Okay, so the first question, identify the vector that is perpendicular to both this vector i plus 2j plus minus 3k and minus i plus j minus 2k from the following. Okay, so what you would try to do is mostly try to take these and do the dot product of each of them, which each of these vectors. And I think that's a really not a very good, very good way to go about it. What you could try and do is find the cross product for these two so that you can directly choose the option without having to actually go ahead and do the dot product for each one of them. Okay, so let's look at uh, this. Okay, so the cross product of any two vectors yields a vector that is perpendicular to both the vectors. So we take a cross product of, say, vector A and B. The resultant vector that you get, say vector C, is perpendicular to both A as well as B. This is something that we've done since probably standard 11. Okay, so let's just look at the definition. So if you have a vector C, C, A cross B, you can write it in this determinant sort of a form. Okay, so once you insert the given vectors into this, okay, you could either use this big formula that you have, or what you could use is something called the Saurus method. Okay, which we have discussed about several times. I think in lecture one, we started off with something called this method, Saurus method. Okay, so what you do basically is you have to rewrite this matrix. So how do you do that? You have an I cap, J cap, K cap, one, minus one, two, one, minus three, and minus two. Let me just try and get some space here. Okay, so what do you have now? you have to repeat this column and this column again. So you have one minus one, J cap two and one. Okay, so now what you can do is you can multiply this this way. So that's minus four I cap. So I cap into two into minus two, that's minus four I cap. Similarly, you have j cap into minus 3 into minus 1, that is plus 3j cap. And here you have plus k cap. Okay, and then subtract it. And now let me just take a different color. And now you take this one. Okay, so you have to remember this negative sign here. Without that, the Saurus method basically is going to give you a wrong result. So remember this negative sign here when you're taking the next set of products. So you have minus 1 into 2 into k, so that's minus 2 k cap. This is minus 3 i cap. And this is going to be minus 2 j cap. Okay. So now since you've got a negative, all of this is going to become positive. Okay. So what do you finally have? You have something like 4 and 3 here. So that's a minus i cap. Um, you have, this is going to be um, plus 5j cap, and then you finally have plus 3k cap. So that, what you have, is option C. Okay, so let's just go back and look at the options that we have. Yeah, so that's going to be option C that you have, minus i cap plus 5j cap plus 3k cap. Okay. So now let's move on to the next question. Okay. Now this is pretty simple. This just involves one definition, knowing one definition called the gradient of the scalar function. Always remember that the gradient of a scalar function is going to give you a vector. So basically you're taking this is a vector. So basically what you're doing is taking a dot product of two vectors. Okay. So let's look at the options. These are the several options that you have. So a dot product of two vectors is going to become a scalar. So let's look at this. Let's look at the gradient. The gradient is basically the vector derivative of a scalar field, phi. So this is how the gradient is written, dou by dou x i cap, dou by dou y j cap, and dou by dou z k cap into the scalar function phi, which should give you a, it spits out a vector. So basically you have two x squared y, you do a dou by dou x of this, you get four x y i cap plus two x squared j cap plus zero k cap. 
Now, what you're supposed to be, what, what is given in the question is that you need to evaluate it at this particular point, one comma one. So what you do here is, yeah, you evaluate it at this particular point, one comma one, and then you can calculate it. So your gradient of a scalar function at this particular point, one comma one is four i cap plus two j cap. Next, what you do is you have this vector a that is given to you. So you have two y i cap minus x squared y j cap at one comma one. Okay, so the vector a basically becomes a is equal to two i cap minus j cap. And then you have this. So a dot del phi, which is the quantity that they've asked you to calculate, that is equal to two i cap minus j cap dot product with four i cap plus two j cap. And that should give you four twos are eight minus two, that's two and number six. Okay, so that's a very easy problem to look into. Now let's look at this. Okay, so this is a little bit uh, a little bit uh, intensive okay so now what you need to calculate is the value of the integral so what you do see here is that this is quite similar to your similar to the fourier transform okay the fourier transform that you have fourier transform uh, without the constant, okay? So if you add a constant here, one divided by root of two pi, this is kind of like similar to a Fourier transform. But what you do see here, it's not just a random function, but it's a derivative of a function, okay? So you have d by dx of delta um, x. It's basically the derivative of the Dirac delta function. Now, what you need to do is you want to calculate the value of this integral. So here k is a constant, delta x is a Dirac delta function. And it is given by the following points that you have. Okay, so you need to calculate which one, uh, what is the result of this, and then mark this up. Right? So now let's look at this. Okay, so I will go ahead with two questions. Okay, so question one is basically what is the Fourier transform of the Dirac delta function, x minus a? Stand. Let's just keep it as in the most general form, which is delta of x minus a. Question two will be, what is the Fourier transform of uh, the derivative of the function? So you want to calculate what is the Fourier transform of, say, f prime of x, okay? And then the last part where I will be discussing is probably an additional point telling you what is the Fourier transform of the nth derivative, okay? Fourier transform of the nth derivative of a function, okay? So let's look at this. So this integral, delta integral from negative infinity to infinity, d by dx of delta x e to the power of i k x dx is very much similar to the Fourier transform. And it's only missing this constant that you have here, one divided by root of two pi. So now the idea to solve this is to exploit the Fourier definition of the Fourier transform, okay? And you need two things, okay? So one is to look at the Fourier transform, the Dirac delta function, Two is to look at the Fourier transform, the derivative of a function, because you have both of that here. Now, once you try and exploit both of this, you should try and make it into a form of the Fourier transform. Okay, and how do you do that? You do that by multiplying this particular constant and then evaluating it. So we will look at this. Okay, so what are the things that you need to remember? This has nothing to do with the Fourier transform. Okay, this is basically uh, to do with your Dirac delta function. So the idea is that integral from negative infinity to infinity over all space, what the Dirac delta function basically looks like is just a sharp point like that. And you have, let's say, A here. Okay, so this is basically X that's varying this way and this way. So over all space, when you try and evaluate this function, okay, what you basically end up getting is F of A over the entire region. Okay. So now let's look at uh, this, okay, the Fourier transform definition. This is something that you need to remember as well. So here, what I've told you is that Fourier transform is basically taking you from your time domain to the frequency domain, okay? So this is time, this is frequency. And the other thing that it does, it basically takes you from space to a wave number. Okay, so these things can be alternatively used. Also, I have seen sometimes uh, for k 
k they sometimes write s okay so these don't get confused by the notation in different questions that there are the general idea of a fourier transform is irrespective of all of this try to put it in terms of x and k or try to put it in terms of t and omega rewrite this so that it's easy to um, kind of like work with the variables that you know so if you get a question and it's not in terms of t or omega then you need to like try to change it into t and omega so that you can just uh, calculate using the standard definitions that you know because it's going to be easier once you start converting them otherwise it's going to take a longer amount of time trying to figure out or even make mistakes while uh, working on these variables okay so you have g of k which is equal to 1 divided by root of 2 pi integral from negative infinity to infinity f of x e to the power of i k x dx okay so those are the things that you needed to remember so for, let's look at the first question find the fourier transform the dirac delta function okay we know that the integral from negative infinity f of x dx delta of x minus a dx is equal to f of a okay that's something that you had to commit to memory and then the second thing the definition of the fourier transform g of k is equal to one divided by root of two pi integral from negative infinity to infinity f of x e to the power of i k x dx now let's assume that in this particular definition that you have of the of the dirac delta function let us assume that this function is e to the power of i k x e to the power of i k x so you substitute e to the power of i k x in that and then what does it do it basically starts to look like a fourier transform okay it starts to look like this part that you have here except for the fact that instead of you know just having a random function f of x here what you would have basically is the delta function becoming the function in question okay the delta function that you need to start looking at the fourier transform of okay so once you do that basically what you see is that this is like your you know the the property of the dirac delta function that you have so you end up getting f of a but here what do you have here your f of x is different okay so the f of x over here is not the f of x over here I hope you get that point okay so the f of x here that you see is the e to the power of i k x whereas the f of x here that you see in this fourier transform definition refers to this delta function delta of x minus a okay so once you start using this property of the fourier of, of the dirac delta function it becomes easier to calculate this value okay so that's f of a which is e to the power of i k a now what's the only thing that's missing here the thing that's missing here is the constant which is one divided by root of two pi okay so now let's move on to the next one that we have so you multiply by one divided by root of two pi over both the sides that means you start to get the fourier transform of the dirac delta function okay you got the fourier transform of the dirac delta function now what do we do we want to find out the fourier transform of delta of x okay so for finding out the fourier transform of delta of x what do you basically do you have your a is equal to zero right so once you do that you end up getting e to the power of zero which is one one divided by root of two pi so the fourier transform of the direct delta function is an exponential function so this could be possibly a question what 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 does the fourier transform of the dirac delta function give you and if you know this point you could eventually like directly tick that it's an exponential instead of going through the whole calculation so that's why i'm kind of like repeating certain things over and over again so that it kind of like gets gets you the idea of what the answers really are going to be instead of actually wasting time during the exam to calculate it okay so if a is equal to zero this we just discussed now if a is equal to zero then the fourier transform of the dirac delta function is delta of x is equal to one divided by root of two pi okay now let's look at this okay one of the points that i want to tell you is this okay so here what we have is basically when your x tends to plus or minus infinity the function goes off to zero okay the dirac delta function that you were talking about goes up to zero why it's only at a particular point say zero or say a point a that you have a peak value other than that this function goes up to zero when x tends to plus or minus infinity 
because this is a very important point. The next basic principle that I'm going to be telling you only works if the function that you have, say something like, for example, the Dirac delta function goes up to zero. Okay, so the, the derivatives that I'm talking about, the, the, for, uh, the uh, Fourier transform of the derivative that I'm going to be talking about has to have this particular property where the function tends off to zero. Okay, so this is extremely important and I'm reiterating it over and over again so that it kind of like gets into your head. f of x has to tend to zero as x tends to plus or minus infinity. Otherwise, this particular thing won't work. You can't use it for any function that you like. We can only use it for such functions. Okay, so find the Fourier transform of the derivative of a function if f of x tends to zero as x tends to plus or minus infinity or prove that the Fourier transform of the derivative of the function f of x is equal to minus i k f of the Fourier transform of the, of the function itself. So here you have the derivative of the function and here you're expressing it in terms of the function. Okay. Now let's move on to this. So let's assume that the Fourier transform of the function is g of k. What have I done? I have said that this particular thing that I have is g of k. Okay. And then I need to try and start calculating this. So first what I will do with this, I will write the Fourier transform, the derivative of the function as such. So you have one divided by root of two pi integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the power of i k x f prime of x dx which is equal to one divided by root of two pi integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the power of i k x. And I can also write this as d of f of x because I'm looking at the derivative of the function. Next, what do you have? You, this is your first function and this is your second function. Okay, so I have to now do something called integration by parts. Okay. So now let's clear all of this off and let's move on to integration by parts. So what you had your first function to be was e to the power of i k x. The second function was going to be uh, what f prime of x. So first function you write it as such into integral of second function which is f of x and you need to start uh, evaluating this from negative infinity to infinity minus Integral of the derivative of the first function, which is i k e to the power of i k x into integral of the second function. So now what happens? In this case, I told you this property, this particular property, f of x tends to zero as x tends to plus or minus infinity. So this particular part becomes equal to zero. Now you have zero here. Okay, so you have a minus i k integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the power of i k x f of x dx. So this part gets goes off. And what do you have finally? This is basically g of k that we've assigned, which is basically uh, 1 divided by root of 2 pi integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the power of i k x f of x dx. We assumed that before. We said let f of f of x be equal to g of k. We said that before. So that's what's here. Okay. And then what can you write? You can write minus i k g of k. Okay. Once you pull this out and pull this in, you can write this as g of k. So let me clear all of that up. And now we finally have this particular thing since, since the thing that I just wrote before a few minutes, a few seconds ago, f of x is equal to g of k is equal to one divided by root of two pi integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the power of i k x f of x dx. Okay, now what you need to do is you need to be able to start calculating what is asked in the question integral from negative infinity to infinity d by dx of delta x e to the power of i k x dx. So what do you do in order to convert this into a Fourier transform? First thing that you do is multiply by one by root two. Okay. 1 divided by root of 2 pi, sorry. 1 divided by root of 2 pi into the answer that is required. You need to multiply both sides. Okay, so this is the answer that you want. So you say this is the answer. Equate this to the answer. Okay, and then you get to multiply both sides by 1 divided by root of 2 pi. Now, what are they asked for here? They've asked the derivative of the function. Okay, the Fourier transform of the derivative of the function. So let's just write this. As some, let's just assume that this delta function is some function f of x. 
Okay, so then you can easily remember and write this as this is the derivative of the function f of x. Okay, that's your first step. After that, what do you do? Then later on, you try to calculate the uh, Fourier transform of the delta function. What did we talk about when we said that the Fourier transform? What did we say that the Fourier transform of the delta function was? We said that it was an exponential. But this, what do we get? We get e to the power of i k a divided by root of two pi. That's what we got. But in this case, a is equal to zero. So what we get is one divided by root of two pi, and that's what's written. That's what's going to be written here. Okay. So you get this particular value to be evaluated as. 1 divided by root of 2 pi into minus i k. So you cancel both of these sides. The answer required finally is minus i k. That is, let's go back to the question. That's going to be a lot of slides. Once we go back to the question, we realize it's option D, which is minus i k. Okay. Now, uh, after this, what I basically have done is I want to show you how to do the Fourier transform for the nth derivative. Okay. Now, this property that I told you about, f of x tending to zero, has to tend to, if you if you have, let's say, f double prime of x, if you want to calculate f double prime of x, second derivative of x, okay. A second derivative of this function. If you if you want to do it, if you want to calculate the Fourier transform for this, you need to make sure that this f prime of x is equal to zero. Okay, so this rule even applies here for each of the sub each of the derivatives that come along. Okay, so if you want to do the Fourier transform of uh, the derivative of a function, we just found that out. It's minus i k Fourier transform of the function itself. If you want to find it for the second derivative, you have minus i k whole squared, and then you have this f, f Fourier transform for the uh, f of x, and then you have, and, and then it goes on and on. So basically, generalizing it, what you basically get is minus i k. If you want to find out the Fourier transform for the nth derivative, you basically have minus i k whole power n f of the Fourier transform of the function itself. So, okay. So now let's move on to this question, question number four. Okay. So what do we need to look at here? We need to be careful about what we have here. Not that it's very, very important because once you find out the roots of this particular, uh, of the auxiliary equation that you obtain from here, you're going to be able to calculate it. You're going to immediately take the solution. But just for the sake of, you know, like looking into the question in particular, they ask for two independent solutions. So it's not the complete solution that they're looking for, but rather they're looking for two independent solutions and how do you find them? Okay. So these are the several options that are given to you. Now, what I want to do is, what I want to tell you in particular is that this part, this problem is pretty easy because the uh, RHS that does not involve any function of X. Okay. It does not involve any function of x, so it's pretty simple and easy to calculate. But it, if it does involve, uh, say, a function of x, then what are you going to do? You're basically going to get your solution to be equal to some kind of a complementary function uh, plus a particular integral. But in this case, the particular integral that you get is going to be zero, so you don't have this at all. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so let's look at the method to solve this. So if you look at the differential equation, the question which is of this form. Okay, so this is the um, n order differential equation that you have. And these are the several constants. Okay, so what do you do? You start off with putting d. Okay, d by dx is equal to d. This is something that we've done in BSC a lot, a lot of different type, especially in the math part. So yeah, you have something like this, and then you write down the auxiliary equation and equate it to zero. And so, yeah, like this is basically the symbolic coefficient of symbolic coefficient of y that you have. Okay. So this is the auxiliary equation that we're talking about. And then you equate it to zero, find out the roots of the auxiliary equation, and then you try to find out the complete solution. Okay. So this is the roots of the auxiliary equation and the corresponding part of the complete solution that you have. So if you have one real root, let's say M1, your 
solution is going to be C1 e to the power of M1x. If you have two real roots which are different, say M1 and M2, you have C1 e to the power of M1x plus C2 e to the power of M2x. If you have, say, two real roots and both of them are equal, then you would have C1 plus C2x e to the power of M1x. Say you have three real roots and all of the three are equal. You have C1 plus C2x plus C3x squared e to the power of M1x. Now we have one pair of complex roots, alpha plus i beta. Then you're going to have, once you start having complex, you have sine and cos coming up. Okay. So the beta part is with the cos and the sine. And the alpha part is basically supposed to be with this. Okay. So this was supposed to be alpha. Okay. So e to the power of alpha x, c1 cos of beta x plus c2 sine of beta x. Then if you have two pairs of complex numbers, both of them like this, okay, both of them like this, you have e to the power of alpha x, c1 plus c2 x cos of beta x plus c3 plus c4x sine of beta x. And this is probably going to be very rare in these kind of questions, in these kind of uh, tests. Okay. So let's look at this. What's given in the question is d squared y by dx squared plus 3dy by dx plus 2y is equal to zero. So what do you do? You write that uh, in the form of d squared plus 3d plus 2y is equal to zero. This is your auxiliary equation. And now what you do is you have to split them up and factorize them. Once you split them up and factorize them, you get your roots as m1 is equal to minus 1 and m2 is equal to minus 2. Now, what is the corresponding part of the complete solution that we looked at? When the roots are different, we have C2, c1 e to the power of m1x plus c2 e to the power of m2x. And this is how the solution is given because m1 is minus 1, you substitute minus 1 here, m2 is minus 2, substitute minus 2 here, and then you get the complete solution. Now, what is asked for is the two independent solutions. So you make each of the constants 0, 1 at a time. Okay. So you look at this. Look at this, and then you know directly it's option A because you have e to the power of minus x and e to the power of minus 2x. And how are they going to be the independent solutions? It's only when one of them are made 0 and the other, my, other constant is made unity. So you have, let's say, pull out this off. So you have c1 e to the power of minus x. And what you can write this as is c1 because these are arbitrary constants that you're looking at. Okay. And then the other one, c2 e to the power of minus 2x, you could write c2 as 1, so you have c2 e to the power of minus 2x. Okay, so that is option D. So let's just go back and look at it. That is the two independent solutions of the following differential equation are e to the power of minus x and e to the power of minus 2x. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Okay. So the number of independent components of a real anti-symmetric tensor of rank two in four dimensions is, okay. So what are the number of independent components in a real anti-symmetric tensor of rank two in four dimension? Okay. Uh, there, there are, people make a lot of mistakes when calculating the um, independent components of an anti-symmetric tensor because they don't really look at the property of an anti-symmetric tensor and close, okay. So let me just go on to discuss what a symmetric tensor really is. So here, if you have two contravariant and two covariant or two covariant components interchanged and they keep the components of the tensor unaltered. So let's say these are contravariant components. Okay, these are contravariant components and these ones at the bottom are basically covariant components. Okay, these ones at the bottom are covariant components. These at the top are the contravariant components. And what you have here is you need to switch. Let's say you switched M and P. Okay, so what it basically tells is that then you say the, it, the tensor is symmetric in P and M. Okay, now if you're looking at skew symmetric or anti symmetric tensor, the sign changes on changing the indices. Then you say that the tensor is Q-symmetric in M and P. So now what I want you to be careful about is D, the dimension, and also R, the rank. Okay. Often these are very interchangeably used and confused and thought of as the same. Okay. So 
when you say that a tensor is living in d dimensions it basically means that the index runs from 1 to d and when you say that the rank of the tensor is r it's basically referring to the number of indices as having so if i say let's say let's go back to the question and let's look at that okay so let's look at this. The number of independent components of a real anti-symmetric tensor of rank 2 in four dimensions. Okay. So the dimension is basically 4. The rank that you have is 2. Okay. So it's basically looking at something like this. Okay. Let's say A, I, J. Let's leave out the co covariant and contravariant part because it really doesn't matter. Okay. So I will just for ease of writing it because I'm used to covariant, I will just write AIJ, okay? So AIJ is basically the number of indices that you have, referring to the number of indices, where I spans from one to four, okay? And J spans from, and J spans from one to four, okay? So these span from one to four and your matrix is going to start looking something like this. A1, one, one, A1, two, A1, three, A1, four. And then you have A2, one, A2, two, two, and so on. Till about, this is going to be A4, four, four. Okay. So you would have four rows, four columns, and that's how it's going to be. Okay. So the total number of components. Don't look at independent components. The total number of components would basically be how much? D power R, which is 4 power 2. That's going to be 16. Okay. So if you'll count these up, you get about 16 components. So let's go into the question and explore this a bit. Okay. So in a D dimensional space, the number of N components of a tensor of rank without specific symmetry, basically telling you whether it's anti-symmetric or whether it's symmetric is n, which is equal to d power r. We just did that now, okay? So we had four power two, which is equal to 16 components in total. Next, let's look at the thing. For totally symmetric tensors, this is gonna be given by this particular uh, combination. Okay, so you have D plus R minus one factorial divided by R factorial into D minus one factorial. Now, why am I giving you this formula? Because you can then evaluate it based on the dimension and rank for any different kind of thing, not just for things that you can write on paper. Okay, Because you can write a tensor of rank two on paper. When it starts to become tensor of rank three, tensor of rank four, you can't start writing it on paper. Okay, so this is basically for those kind of problems that come up. And then for a totally anti-symmetric tensor, you have d factorial divided by r factorial into d minus r factorial, which is pretty much easier than the other one. So here you have d plus r minus one. Okay, here you just have d and r at the top. Four. Okay, so now let's look at this. This is the this is the matrix that we have considered in the question. Okay, and what ha starts to happen when you have anti-symmetric tensors, okay? So anti-symmetric tensors, basically your A11 is equal to minus of A11. That's your de general formula that you have, right? So Aij is equal to minus of Aji. That's what you have. When you switch them up, they become negative. And when do they become, when, when is this criteria satisfied? It's only when A11 is equal to zero. Now, if you have an issue with this, basically take this minus a11 to the other side. So you have 2a11 equal to 0. Therefore, it implies that a11 is equal to 0. Okay. So for an anti-symmetric tensor, this is same for a22. a22 also has to be equal to 0. Same for a33, a44. So all these guys are going to be 0 for an anti-symmetric tensor. All the diagonal elements are going to be 0 for an anti-symmetric tensor. Now, what are the other things that you have? You have A12 is equal to negative of A21. So if you know A12, you know A21. Okay, it's just the negative of the other one. So how many independent components are there? Let's, let's mark up the independent components that we have. So you have A12, A13, A14, A15, A2, sorry, 
A14, A23, A24, and A34. Okay, so these are the number of independent components that you have, because if you know so much, then you get the entire data of the matrix, okay? And given the fact that it's an anti-symmetric tensor, you can write up the matrix. Think of it that way. So the number of components that you know will help you generate the entire matrix that you have, given the fact that it's anti-symmetric. Okay, so let's look at this. Using the formula for a totally anti-symmetric tensor, what, what do we calculate? We calculated the value uh, of the number of components as six, right? We calculated it to be just this. Okay, so let's see if we get that from the formula. D is basically equal to what? D is basically equal to four factorial divided by two factorial into D minus R, which is again, let's say four minus two, which is again, two factorial. So you get four factorial divided by two factorial into two factorial, which is going to give you three into four divided by two, and that's going to give you a six. Okay, so we ended up with the same thing that we counted by hand. Now, let's look. Okay, so we looked at this. Now let's look at it for a symmetric case. Okay, what happens in the symmetric case? In the symmetric case, A11 is equal to A11, okay? So it does not have to be zero. It can be zero, but it does not have to be zero. So the total number of independent components, if you start counting it now, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, inclusive of the diagonal elements and the upper triangle elements, okay? The lower triangle can be found out from the upper triangle. So we just, because of, because of the certain symmetry, tensor property that it, that is okay so you can find that out and how many how many when you count it by hand so you have one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten ten components in the case of a symmetric tensor okay so let's go back and evaluate it using the formula that we have here so that's going to be four plus two minus one whole factorial in two factorial and then you have four minus one factorial which is about let's say four plus one that is five factorial two factorial and three factorial so that's going to be four into five divided by two so that's ten okay so we've kind of like matched it with the one that we know from here and with the one that we know uh, from the formula and the one that we know by doing it by drawing the matrix up Okay, so let's look at this question. This is a complex analysis question that we have. Okay, so if V of X comma Y is equal to 2X plus 3 and F of Z is U plus IV, let's just lose this uh, function part because it's just very uh, super to keep writing it over and over again. Okay, is analytic and further, if at the point Z is equal to zero, okay, uh, you have 2 plus 3i, okay? So basically that's telling you that u is equal to 2 and v is equal to 3 at this point that you have, which is z equal to 0. What is z? z is basically x plus i, y. So your x and y at this particular point is equal to 0 comma 0. That's what it means, okay? So now let's look at the several options that we have, we need to evaluate what? We need to evaluate this part of the function, okay? So we need to evaluate the real part of this uh, complex function, okay? So now let's go to this, okay? So uh, this is basically the property of analyticity or differentiability. So we've been doing this in, I think, BSE maths a lot, okay? This is where we first encountered them. Um, and we have F here as u plus i v and f of x equal to as a function of x and y, u as a function of x and y, v as a function of x and y. So if that is the situation, then we have these equations called the cauchy riemann equations of the CR conditions. That means do u by do x is equal to do v by do y, do v by do x is equal to minus do u by do y. Okay. So using these two properties and the differential, total differential that we have over here. Okay. So you can write any function. Okay, which is a function of two variables in this form. 
So even if you have, let's say, you could probably use this on other problems as well. Let's say you had a function, which is a function of X, Y, and Z. We can write DF is equal to do F by do X DX plus do F by do Y DY and do F by do Z DZ. Okay, you could write this up. So you could use this property of the total differential that you could use this formula for the total differential in other problems as well. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, question that's given to us. We've had the imaginary part of the complex function that we have that, okay? And we need to calculate somehow the real part of the complex function. So in order to do, do that, we use the CR conditions, do u by do x, is what? Do u by do x is do v by do y. So you calculate do v by do y, which is going to give you a 2x. And the other one is going to be do v by do x. So you're going to get a 2y. And here you have a negative sign. So you need to incorporate that into the total differential. So the total differential is du of x comma y is equal to do u by do x dx plus do u by do y dy, which is equal to 2x that you have from here dx plus minus 2y into dy. Okay, now once you start integrating this, you get an x squared divided by 2, and that's how your constant goes off. If you start integrating this, you get an x squared divided by 2, this goes off. You get a y squared divided by 2, this goes off. Okay, so that, that was horribly written. y squared divided by 2, these two go off. So you get a y squared. So you get an x squared minus y squared because of this negative sign that you have from here. And then you have a constant of integration. Now, how do you calculate the constant of integration? Remember that the uh, function that you had, what was it? Uh, f of z at z is equal to zero, which meant x comma y equal to zero, okay, uh, is equal to, what was it? Three plus two y? No. It was 2 plus 3i. Okay, so this was 2 plus 3i. So f at z equal to 0. Okay, so now what should you do? You should put 2 here. Okay, so basically what you need to do, let me just write that more evidently. You have u of 0 comma 0. This part equal to 2 is equal to 0 plus minus 0 squared plus c. So you get c is equal to 2. Now this part is not really necessary because when you look at the options, you kind of get the answer without having to calculate the constant of integration. Okay. So this, let's just write this down here. u of x comma y is equal to x squared minus y squared plus 2. And this particular thing, x squared plus, minus y squared plus c. Okay, so now I'll go back to the question. Okay, so what you have here is an x squared minus y squared plus 2, like we calculated. But once you get this form, you realize that all the other options that you have have this y or x components associated with it. So it's not going to be any of these options, it only has to be a constant. Okay. So that's how you can how, how you can eliminate this uh, calculation for the constant of integration and proceed to tick the answer. Okay, so let's move on to the seventh question. Okay, <clears throat> so in this question, what you need to remember is there is a trick. Okay, I I would be deriving the trick for you so that you can remember it. Okay, there is a tricky formula uh, that you can use for this particular thing. So you can directly find out the answer. Okay. So let's uh, look at the options that there are. So the value of what you need to calculate is integral of C. It's clockwise. Okay. Remember that it's clockwise and DZ divided by Z. Okay. Conventionally, if you do, if there's nothing mentioned in the question, you're supposed to be assuming anti-clockwise. If at all specifically they mentioned clockwise then you need to change the sign of your answer accordingly okay so the integral signs based on the direction of the contour this has to be remembered so if it is clockwise okay if it is clockwise it's going to be negative and how do you remember this okay 
basically what you're doing when you're st starting clockwise is you're starting from 2 pi, okay, and then going off to 0. In the case of anti-clockwise, what you're doing is you're starting from 0 and you're going off to 2 pi, okay. So when you integrate this, you're getting 2 pi to 0. And when you integrate this, you're going from 0 to 2 pi, from 0 to 2 pi, okay. So what do you have? You basically have to swap these integrals and put a negative sign. So you have 0 to 2 pi here. And that's why this negative and positive sign come up. So by convention, it's always assumed to be anti-clockwise. The contour's direction is assumed to be anti-clockwise. Otherwise, you, otherwise, if at all it is specified in the question, if clockwise is specified, then you do take it this in. Okay. So here, when we look at our question, they've actually specified clockwise. Okay, it's specified clockwise path. It's supposed to be negative. So you can automatically pick the answer as B. Okay, but what I'm going to do is not that. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do this whole thing. Okay. So let's look at this. This is basically the trick that I want you to remember. Okay, this is something that you have to commit to memory. 1 divided by 2 pi i integral of c z power n dz. Okay. If n is not equal to minus 1, if n is not equal to minus 1, that means if it is not of 1 by z form, then it is 0. If it is 1 by z, if n is equal to minus 1, then it is going to be 1. Otherwise, it's going to be 0. Okay, so that's what you're supposed to remember. And note that in the question that they've asked, they've asked for 1 by z dz. Okay, so this part isn't there. So don't go ahead and tick 1 directly. You have to multiply that 1 with the 2 pi i that you have here. Okay, so you remember this formula up and I'll show you right now how to de derive this whole thing. So if c is a circle of unit radius, okay, so that has to be very that we will use in the problem. Okay, so let's look at this question again. They have specified unit radius, unit circle here. Okay, so that's why we're able to use this particular property over here. So let's look at this. So you prove that 1 divided by 2 pi i integral of c z power n dz is equal to 0 if n is not equal to minus 1 is 1 if n is not equal to 1, if n is equal to minus 1, sorry. If C is a circle of uh, unit radius around Z is equal to zero, which means that the origin, then let's work this out, okay? So um, how do you represent this complex number? Z is equal to R e to the power of I theta, okay? And when you take the derivative of this, DZ is equal to e to the power of I, e to the power of I theta D theta, okay? So that's how you take this. I've just written this as exponential. So if it's confusing for you, then we have, okay, so this is supposed to be R, not E, R I e to the power of I theta D theta. Now here you need to calculate the integral. So how do you calculate the integral? If I is equal to one divided by two pi I integral of C Z power N D Z, which is equal to one divided by two pi I integral of what is Z power N R to the power of N exponential of I. Okay, so when you take power N, it's going to be I theta N, right? or i n theta, whatever, doesn't matter. The order doesn't matter. And then here you have an r i. Again, you have this exponential that comes from the dz that you had. So what you're doing is taking all the z variables and making it into theta form. Why is that you're doing that? Because you have the contour that you've, that you've pictured. It is going from, let's say, 0 to 2 pi or 2 pi to 0. Okay, either way. Because this here is... Uh, basically according to convention. So it's going in the clockwise direction. But the problem that we have is going in the, uh, sorry, yeah, this is going in the anti-clockwise direction, which is convention. The problem that we have is going against convention is going clockwise. Okay, so what you're supposed to do is take change from the Z variable to something like an R, which they've said is constant because you have a unit circle. Okay, so your R is equal to one unit circle. So your R is equal to one. And the only variable factor that you have to factor in here is theta. Otherwise, what do you have to do? You have to factor in x and y, which are the components of z, right? So you write z is equal to x plus iy. So you need to do a double integral or so, 
but this is a very easy way to do those interviews. Okay, when you look at complex analysis and stuff. Okay, so now if n is not equal to minus one, what do you do? Okay, so once you simplify that particular previous integral, what you're going to be getting here. Okay, so once you take this r power n plus one out, because it's a constant, you can take it out and you have an e to the power of i n plus one theta d theta. Where does this plus one come from? It comes from the derivative. Okay, I feel most people make a mistake here because if they haven't done it for a long time, they, they miss this d theta out and, and they miss this whole thing out. Like, like they forget about taking a dz over here. Okay. And, and they also uh, miss this part out. They forget to write it in terms of your angle so that you can evaluate it faster and end up saying z is equal to x plus i y, dz is equal to dx plus i dy, and then calculate it in this whole bunch of mess. Okay. So if you can evaluate it with just one integral, it's more, much more easier. Okay. So now let's come back. If n is not equal to minus one, if n is not equal to one, this one, what is the case? So this is the uh, integral of an exponential. So you know that it's pretty easy to do that. All you have to do is divide it by this constant parameter that is associated with theta. So if you have e to the power of i, n plus one theta, how do you calculate the integral? You calculate d theta. How do you calculate the integral? You calculate it as e i n plus 1 theta divided by i n plus 1. Okay, so you can take this from 0 to 2 pi and evaluate the integral. So this is going to give you what? If you have a 2 pi here, you know the form of uh, the Euler's form of e to the power of i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. And if you evaluate this, if you substitute 2 pi here, what do you end up getting? You end up getting a 0. If you substitute 0 here, what do you get? You end up getting a 0. So this is going to be 0. So the integral any for any value of n other than minus 1, it's going to give you a 0. But what happens in the case if it is minus 1? So if it is minus 1, then this whole thing goes away. Okay. So if that whole thing goes away, you just have a one factor that's here and you have d theta. So when you evaluate this, you end up getting 2 pi here. Okay. And once you end up getting 2 pi, you know that r is equal to 1 because it's a unit circle. So this is going to be 1. This is going to get cancelled. Your integral is going to be equal to 1. Okay. Now let's look at this case. Yeah. This is the case where you had n is equal to minus 1. So i is equal to r plus 1 divided by 2 pi. Just revisiting this whole thing again, 0 to 2 pi. Once you have minus 1, this factor goes away. It disappears. Okay. Just a second. Yeah. This factor goes away. It disappears. So you only have a 1 here. 1 d theta is theta. So you integrate it. And then you end up getting i is equal to r power n plus 1. But since you have a unit circle, you have i is equal to i n plus 1 is equal to 1. Okay. So now we found out that 1 divided by 2 pi i integral from c z power n dz is equal to 0 if n is not equal to minus 1 and 1 if n is equal to minus 1. So let's just write this n equal to minus 1 in a very, very lucid form. What do you have here? You have 1 divided by 2 pi i integral of c 1 by z dz is equal to 1. Or you can write integral of c dz divided by z is equal to 2 pi i. Okay. So now let's look at the next point. Here it's basically stating this over again. Okay. But this, when you did it, you calculated it for anti-clockwise. When it is clockwise, you just put a negative sign along with it. Okay. So since the value of the, the, the contour goes in the clockwise direction, we would have to evaluate it from 2 pi to 0. All you have to do is take the same result and put a negative sign. That's all. Okay. So now let's move on to the next question. Okay. Group theory is something that has been completely ignored in our syllabus. We do not learn about Lie groups. Okay. We do not learn about all of this stuff, but I've tried to tabulate the important points and, you know, like uh, put it across. 
I guess it's quite interesting to actually calculate the number of independent parameters or the generators of these uh, Lie groups, and they do have a lot of lot of significance. Okay, so so things like O3 is basically the rotation group. Okay, so it helps in you know calculating all of these. Um, how do you rotate a vector or, or things like that? Okay, so let's just look at this. They've asked for the number of independent parameters of the group O3 and special unitary of dimension two are respectively what? Okay, so I wouldn't say dimension. This is basically N. Okay, so dimension basically refers to the independent parameters that you have or the generators that you have. So this independent parameters are also known as generators, are also known as, um, what did I say a couple of seconds ago? Dimensions. So you have dimensions. Okay, so be very careful about this. This is a very easy thing to do, but a lot of people, they say group theory, they say, oh, they say SU2 and they just leave it out. Okay. So now let's look at this, okay? So this is the name of the group, okay? O basically refers to orthogonal, okay? Here it's special orthogonal. This refers to unitary U, unitary, special unitary. And this is linear, okay? Here you have it for real numbers. Here you have it for complex numbers, okay? So let's just go through the properties of this. Orthogonal. It's kind of intuitive. O transpose O is equal to I. Okay. Apart from O transpose O is equal to I, when you're looking at your special orthogonal group, you have determinant of O is equal to 1. Okay. And these two conditions are sort of like redundant. So when you're looking at them, let's look at it like this. We've all learned about degrees of freedom, right? So in, in some, some systems, the degrees of freedom that you're looking at they kind of like reduce because of particular constraints. And this is something that we've learned in mechanics. Okay. The first semester mechanics, you would have seen if you take up a couple of systems and, and you have, let's say two points are fixed, then the degrees of freedom reduce. This is essentially what's happening here. Okay. So once you say that these particular groups have these properties, they start pushing in constraints. And because of constraints, what's happening, the dimension or the number of independent parameters are being reduced. Like you saw in the case of this Q symmetric part. Okay, let me just go back to that problem for a minute and come back here so that I can make you understand what's basically happening. When I told you there was a constraint of skew symmetric, the number of components that we were talking about here reduced. Okay, so when I told you about, let's look at this skew symmetric, just a second. Okay, so I've probably taken this particular, yeah. When I told you about skew symmetric, what happened? Basically, A11 is equal to minus A11, right? And I told you that when this happens, A11 becomes equal to zero. It's quite intuitive. You take two A here, one one here, and it becomes zero. So all of these parameters started becoming zero. That is because I told you it was skew symmetric. So we were able to reduce the number of independent parameters. Do you realize that we're talking about the same thing here as well? Like in this question, they've actually asked for number of independent components. There they've asked for number of independent parameters. We're looking at the same thing in all of its essence. Okay, so what happened here? When we looked at this, this became zero, this became zero, this became zero, this became zero. So introducing skew symmetric, okay, made the number of independent parameters to one, two, three, four, five, six. When I said it was symmetric, this is not zero. A11 is not zero. A, all of these can be zero, but it's not independent. I mean, these, these are independent, okay? So you have A11, A11. 2, 2, A, 3, 3, and A, 4, 4 being introduced. So you have about 10 components here. So by introducing each of these conditions, let's say saying symmetric or skew symmetric, or in the fact like we introduced O transpose O, 
and we introduced let's say uh, the determinant of o by introducing this we're starting to introduce constraints and when you introduce constraints the number of independent parameters they reduce okay now let's go back here to that particular question um uh, where is it yeah okay so what happened here o transpose o is equal to i and determinant of o is equal to one but you do see that it's the same number okay n into n minus one divided by two n into n minus one divided by two and why is that because this is a redundant constraint that means this determinant of o is equal to one is already being included here okay whereas if you look at the next one for unitary this particular condition that you have here say determinant of u equal to one is not included here and therefore you need to subtract one from here okay so for the first two for the first two what you have is for your orthogonal group you have n into n minus one divided by two i told you these are the number of independent parameters independent parameters or the dimension or the generators that you have for the special for these particular types of groups they're called the lee groups okay they're written lie but they're called lee like bruce lee the actor okay so that's how i remember it so you say lee groups okay now uh here what you have is unitary n so you have an n square and here you have special unitary so you have n squared minus one because that constraint wasn't already included in u dagger u equal to i okay it wasn't already included in this so you had to include that as well now here you have the special linear groups so here you realize they are real numbers okay because they're real numbers you just have one of them right we're looking at complex numbers let's say z is equal to x plus y i y each complex number basically has two real parameters and therefore you have a product two that you have to introduce two into this previous thing okay so this is a very th easy way to remember this and then you can evaluate it for anything that's there okay so if you remember this table you can evaluate it for any value of n you can evaluate it for any particular group because i don't think they're going to ask you more than these set of lee groups okay so now let's look at this you have n into n minus one let's just revise this again so you have orthogonal n into n minus one divided by two special orthogonal which is a little peculiar that means the dimension basically does not change so you have n into n minus one divided by two and why is that because the determinant condition is already being included in o transpose o is equal to i then you have the unitary group that is n squared special unitary n squared minus one and then you have special linear you have n squared minus one again this is for complex so that's why you have the two things there because you have two real numbers in a complex number okay let's think of it that way you have two real numbers in a complex number one is x one is y both of them are real and you have the complex part i separately written out okay so you have two into n squared minus one so now you know this in your head what is asked in the question it's asked to calculate o3 and su2 okay what do you need to calculate you need to calculate O3 and you need to calculate SU2. Okay, so let's look at this. What is O3? O3 is basically n into n minus 1 divided by 2, right? So that's going to be 3 into 3 minus 1, that is 2 divided by 2. Cancel this off. What is SU2? SU2 is basically SU2. This is n squared minus 1. So that's 4 squared minus 1, which is going to give you a 3 again. So what is the option? It's option A, which is which is 3, comma 3. Okay. So that's that's pretty much it for this. So you don't have to get scared of another group theory question ever again. Okay, so this is just to summarize this whole thing. The number of independent elements or dimensions or generators is for the O n, n into n minus 1. For the O 3, it is 3 into 3 minus 1 divided by 2, which is 3. And for the number of, for the S u n group, the number of independent elements or dimensions is n squared minus 1. And you have 2 power 2 minus 1, which is 3. Okay.
So let's come to the second last question that we have. Any Hermitian two cross two matrix H can be expressed in terms of the two cross two identity matrix I and the three poly sigma matrices sigma X, sigma Y, and sigma Z. Okay, so you have H is equal to A zero I plus summation of J is equal to X, Y, Z, A, J, sigma J. Okay, how do you remember? I think we discussed this in uh, lecture two, question number 31, how to remember poly matrices, how to memorize them. Okay, so um, first let's look into memorizing these poly matrices as a revision, and then we will go on to really analyze what this question is basically telling you. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the poly matrices. Okay, so this poly matrix sigma i, sigma zero, which is equal to sigma z x. No, 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 no. This is not sigma x. This is supposed to be i. Okay. Sigma zero is equal to sigma, uh, is equal to i, which is the identity matrix is one, zero, zero, one. Okay. So first things first, you got sigma zero is the identity matrix. Okay. So let's just write this as i. This is the identity matrix. Swap the row and swap the rows that you have to get your sigma x. Okay. Sigma x, you just need to swap the rows. Okay. The next thing that you need to remember is only the middle poly matrix has complex numbers. Okay. Only the middle poly matrix has com complex numbers. So you have sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. And sigma two is the one with complex numbers in them. Okay. So that is going to be, let's write this sigma y. Okay. Take input from sigma x. Okay. For writing sigma x, you took input from sigma zero, which is the identity matrix. All you had to do was swap the rows. Now let's just put i's instead of ones. Then what do you do? You put a negative side at the top. Okay. For the last one, take the input from one again. Okay. So you just write the identity matrix. But in this case, you put the negative side at the bottom. Here you put the negative side on top. Here you put the negative sign at the bottom. For sigma x, you took your input from sigma zero, that is your identity matrix. So one zero zero one became zero one one zero. Again, for the last one, you took your input from the identity matrix. You just had to write it as such, but the negative sign had to be at the bottom. Okay. So these are these are the three things. How do you start off with? Sigma zero is one zero zero one. Sigma x swap the rows, so you have zero one one zero. Sigma y is the only thing with complex numbers in them. That means the middle one. Okay, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. Usually you denote the top one by i. This sigma two is the only one with complex numbers in them. So you take input from sigma x, write the i's, and put the negative sign only for the parameter on top. Then for the sigma z one, take the input from your identity matrix itself, put the negative sign at the bottom. So this is kind of like, you know, like put it into your memory kind of like situation. So this was there in lecture two, question number 31. Okay, I think I did this as a revision. Let's do it again. Okay, now what is being asked in the question? So what's being asked in the question is any Hermitian two cross two matrix H can be expressed in terms of two cross two identity matrix and sum of three sigma poly sigma matrices. Okay, one of the things that you need to know is these sigma matrices that you have here and this uh, that you have here, this identity that you have here are all Hermitian, okay? Hermitian. So sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, all of these, and with this as I, okay? Which can also be written as I, are all Hermitian. So now let's go on to looking at this. So I've kind of like expanded this out now. You have H is equal to A0I plus AX sigma X plus AY sigma Y and AZ sigma Z. Okay. So I've expanded this particular form out. Now, what you could try is, or, or let me just make one more statement. If you add two matrices that are Hermitian, you should get a Hermitian matrix out of them. Okay, so if you're doing the sum of two Hermitian matrices, 
sum of two Hermitian matrices, you should get back a Hermitian matrix. Okay. So now let's look at the properties that are there here. The sum of any number of Hermitian matrices is Hermitian. Each poly matrix is Hermitian. And together with the identity matrix, sometimes considered as a zero poly matrix, which we just discussed, the poly matrices form a basis for the real vector space of two cross two Hermitian matrices. This means that any two cross two Hermitian matrices can be written in a unique way as a linear combination of the poly matrices with all coefficients being real numbers. Okay, so you could actually even try this out yourself. Okay, if you start to say, let me say, I will multiply this sigma two sigma y matrix with a complex number, okay? And I will get zero minus i squared, i squared zero, I will get this. And I have zero, one, minus one, zero, okay? Now, how do I know that this is a Hermitian matrix? I will take the complex conjugate transpose. Since there are no complex numbers, I will not do that. I will just take the transpose. Zero, one, minus one, zero. These two are not equal. A dagger is not equal to A. Therefore, this is not Hermitian. So if I ever say that AY is complex, I will not be getting a Hermitian matrix. So the only way that I can get Hermitian matrices is if all of these numbers that I have are going to be real. And that's what's said in the last point here. This means that any two cross two Hermitian matrix can be written in a unique way as a linear combination of poly matrices with all coefficients being real numbers. Okay, so now we come to our last question. One of the eigenvalues of the matrix e to the power of a is e to the power of, is equal to e to the power of alpha, where a is given as alpha 0, 0, 0, 0 minus i alpha, 0, i alpha, 0. The product of the other two eigenvalues is, now you have to be very careful with this. They've asked you the exponential of a matrix. They've given you a matrix A and they've told you that the exponential of the matrix has an eigenvalue e to the power of alpha. Okay, so you need to remember a couple of properties here. They've asked you, basically they've given you lambda one is equal to e to the power of alpha. What is lambda two into lambda three? Question mark. Okay, that's what they've asked you. So let's look at a couple of properties. Okay. First property that you need to remember is the sum of the eigenvalues of a matrix M is its trace. The sum of the eigenvalues of a matrix M is equal to the trace. So trace of a matrix is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. Second thing that you need to remember is the product of the eigenvalues of a matrix M is its determinant. That means your determinant of M is equal to the product of the eigenvalues. This we wouldn't be using so much here, but this we would be using a lot here. Okay. So the last point, which is very rarely known, is that if a matrix is Hermitian, say A is equal to A dagger, then the determinant of the exponential of matrix is equal to the exponential of a trace of the matrix. Okay, so now what was told is that you had an E power A, right? That once this particular thing's eigenvalue was E power alpha. Let's look at this. Determinant of exponential of A is equal to exponential of trace of a. So determinant of e power alpha, which is basically lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, out of which lambda 1 is given to you, is equal to e to the power of trace of a, a, the matrix a is given to you. So all you have to do is look at the trace of a and see what you get. So let's go back and look at the trace of a. Okay, what is the trace of A? Alpha plus zero plus zero, right? Alpha plus zero plus zero is a trace of A. So that is going to give you trace of A here as alpha. Then what do you have? You have lambda one, lambda one, which is already given to you. E to the power of alpha, lambda two, lambda three is equal to E to the power of alpha. Cross these out and you get lambda two, Lambda 3 is equal to what? 1. So that's option A. So let's just review this again. We have the sum of the eigenvalues of a matrix, which is a trace. We have the product of the eigenvalues of a matrix, which is a determinant. 
and b hat this is a very important condition if the matrix is hermitian a is equal to a dagger you can actually observe this okay so you take first row becomes the first column second row becomes the second column but you have a minus i alpha but you're taking the complex conjugate so you're going to get a plus i alpha and if you take this you're going to get a minus i alpha here okay so let's just do that first row alpha zero zero second row zero zero minus i alpha third row zero i alpha zero take the complex conjugate this becomes minus plus so you know that a dagger is equal to a you know that this is hermitian okay so if it is hermitian then the determinant of e to the power of a is equal to exponential of trace of a okay so be careful we have to find the eigenvalues involving e to the power of a not a this matrix a is hermitian and finally, we have determinant of A is equal to e to the power of alpha. We have written this down. E to the power of alpha is lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And then finally, we can calculate lambda 2 into lambda 3, which is the product of the other two eigenvalues is equal to 1. Okay, so that sums it up for today.